Hey everyone, welcome to this talk and thanks for your interest in dynamic decentralized functional encryption. This is joint work with Jeremy Chotard, Romain Gay, Don Fan, and David Poincheval. My name is Edouard Dufourcens and I worked on this in part while I was at Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris and in part while I was at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh and I'll be giving the talk today. I think we can all agree that one sub area of computer science has had unbelievable growth during the last two decades or so. And unfortunately, if you're at this conference, you probably missed out. Because I'm not talking about cryptography, I'm talking about machine learning. The convergence of the massive availability of many types of data, the affordability of highly parallel compute equipment, and algorithmic advances relevant to machine learning have ushered in a new wave of very successful intelligent products. Of course, it has also raised enormous privacy concerns. Because these machine learning models are trained using databases of sometimes very personal data that are under the control of a few institutions. Because it's so hard to argue against the benefits of better artificial intelligence, it's unlikely that consumers would prefer a system where no data mining occurs. But perhaps cryptography can provide a solution that protects privacy without sacrificing the benefits of machine learning. Now, one might ask, since clearly we're going to be looking at some form of computation involving encrypted data, why not it's something that's already solved by fully homomorphic encryption? And while you can certainly construct solutions to this problem from FHE, I would like to argue that it's not the ideal theoretical cryptographic primitive for our scenario. Recall, FHE is for computing on data you can't see. So in FHE, you would typically have a server computing on data that is owned by a client, and the client, because it knows the secret key, can decrypt the result of the computation. It makes sense for offloading computation to a server, whether for performance reasons or because the model is too large for the client to store. But in the scenario we are describing, we want the server to run the computations, but also to get back the result. FHE can't achieve that, or at least not in a non-interactive way. And to be clear, what we mean by non-interactive here is that in the long run, you should just be sending a single ciphertext of the data you just generated, and then it's up to the server to gather the data of the other parties and to perform the computations. A non-interactive team matters when your clients are regular internet users who will be on and off and are unlikely to have the time or resources to participate in a computationally heavy, massively multi-party protocol. So today, we will be talking about something else. Something that lets a server aggregate our data with that of other participants and in a non-interactive way. That's Dynamic Decentralized Functional Encryption, or DDFE for short. So here's the plan for today. First, we'll briefly talk about functional encryption, its history, and how it relates to DDFE. Then we'll define DDFE, both formally and with some helpful examples. And then, we'll give constructions of DDFE for a few functionalities. We'll start by looking at something we call decentralized sum. In the process of building that, I'll notice that we fall a bit short of the security guarantees we want, that it would be nice to start by adding something to our toolbox. That tool will be all or nothing encapsulation, and we'll show how to build one from identity-based encryption. Finally, we'll present a more complex primitive. It's a decentralized inner product scheme, and we'll try to give an overview of the key ideas behind our construction. The history of functional encryption, in a sense, goes all the way back to the invention of public key encryption. Public key encryption is one of the most basic forms of functional encryption. In 2001, we get identity-based encryption, which allows for some access control. And then in 2006, attribute-based encryption, which is stronger and allows for more complex forms of access control. And it's all culminated in 2011 with functional encryption, which is even stronger and allows for computations on the plain text data. But there's something deeper about functional encryption. It's interesting because it's not just a stronger, more powerful variant of its predecessors. Functional encryption is a framework. What's great about functional encryption is that while the definition allows for schemes that would allow for general computations and general access control structures, it still captures schemes that are much more limited. Public key encryption, identity-based encryption, and attribute-based encryption are all forms of functional encryption, but they are not instances of one another. A great fit of functional encryption is giving cryptographers a common language to use to describe many possibly very different schemes. All it takes is giving the functionality of the scheme and then the definitions and the security game follow immediately. Still, functional encryption has its limitations. There are two that are relevant to what we're talking about today. One is that it doesn't really allow for computations that involve multiple parties. That's a non-starter for what we talked about earlier, aggregating data from multiple users. 
multi-input and multi-client variants of functional encryption were introduced to address this point, but they inherited another issue of functional encryption. There is a master secret key, the older of which can basically learn anything it wants. We tried moving away from this in 2018 with decentralized multi-client functional encryption. But the primitive we defined required the set of participants to be set at the beginning of time, and no new members could join from that point on, so it was not dynamic. Ad hoc, multi-input functional encryption came in a year later. It was dynamic, but in a sense, it lacked the full definitional power that functional encryption had brought. The definitions are tailored to their constructions, and that framework cannot capture some of the functionalities we'll present here today. Now that you have the context, let's start talking about what the DFE is. We'll start with some examples. So we have four people, Alice, Bob, Charlie, and Diane. They have some pictures of themselves that they're probably storing on some device. Now those pictures would be valuable to a company. It can use deep learning to extract valuable intelligence from the data. However, send the data directly to the company so it can mine it? Well, that could be detrimental to the privacy of our subjects. They might not agree to participate or be unhappy about it if it happens without their consent. Lucky for them, as you may have noticed earlier, they're dealing with not very evil corp. And that firm decided it would use the DFE so it can achieve its objectives while protecting its customers' privacy. Full disclosure here, training an actual neural network, it's not something that's realistic to do with the cryptographic tools we have today. So this example is about what a dream application would be, what we're working towards. So all of our friends here would encrypt the data under the DFE. There's some metadata associated with its ciphertext, namely the date and the set of participants. And the policy will be, let's say, that data can only be aggregated between participants that all agree on the date and the set of participants. So they send off those ciphertexts to the not very evil corp. And at that point, these are totally opaque to the company. It might as well be your favorite flavor of NCP encryption. That's because the company has no functional keys. So the company has to go back to the participants for that. In this case, the participants are willing to help, so they each independently compute a functional decryption key of their own. The key is associated with the set of participants and a specific method for training a neural network. Again, all of those will have to match across all participants. And now, the corporation has all it needs to start working. Using the functional keys on the ciphertexts, it can extract knowledge from the data, and nothing more. It doesn't get to see the plain text data, only the result of the training. OK, that's it for our example. Now let's get for more, shall we? For a DTFE scheme, there's a set of keys K and a set of messages M. A DDFE scheme will first be characterized by its functionality. It's essentially the set of functions the scheme can compute. And it also describes how different keys enable different functions. For the DFE, a functionality takes a list of public key functional key pairs and a list of public key message pairs. The way to think about it is that you'll be mixing a bunch of keys and a bunch of messages together to get some value out, as we saw earlier with the neural network training. And each key and each message is fundamentally tied to the identity of its creator, so that we can tell when someone is allowing computation on their own data. Now, for the flow of things, you would start with a setup which generates some shared parameters. Maybe everyone agrees on a hash function, on an elliptic curve parameters, and so on. You do this once, and then everyone can generate their public-private key pair. They advertise the public key. That's their identity for all intents and purposes here. And they keep the secret key to themselves. They'll use it for encrypting and generating functional keys. Finally, anyone can decrypt once they have enough ciphertexts and enough functional keys. That's maybe a bit terse. Let's see how we can connect those concepts to the example we saw earlier. So in our case, you'll remember that our participants would embed into their functional key both the set of participants as they perceived it and the training algorithm. 
that set of participants would really be a set of public keys. And maybe that algorithm was represented as a circuit. Hence the set of keys here. The Cartesian product of the set of sets of public keys and a set of circuits. The message contained an image, a date, and again, a set of participants. So the set of messages is pretty straightforward. Now clearly, we want to hide the image, but perhaps those other attributes don't need to be hidden. That's all okay. It can be expressed with the functionality, as it would be with traditional functional encryption. Now let's take a look at the functionality. It's a bit ugly at first, but we can break it down together. The first argument is a set of keys associated with their users. Recall that the keys are composed of a set of participants and a circuit. Here, the keys are not indexed by PK, so it's very simple. They are the same for all participants in the set. They contain that same set of participants and the circuit that performs neural network training. Up next, we have the messages. Here, again, everyone agrees on the date and everyone agrees on the set of participants. But each participant has their own image. And so, the result of that evaluation will be a neural network trained on the set of images. Simple as that. Notice that this is a simple functionality in that the set of users who provide keys is the same as the set of users who provide messages, while our framework doesn't actually require that. Now that we've had an overview of what the DFE is, we can move on to actual constructions. We'll start with decentralized sum. At a high level, decentralized sum is about computing sums, or to be accurate, repeated group operations in finite abelian groups. In practice, the group A will often be that of modular integers. So our messages will contain a group element that we want to aggregate with other people's group elements. We need to specify the set of people we want to aggregate with, and we'll want to agree on a label. In practice, this is something that might be set to the date, so that if we want to aggregate different data later on, an attacker can come in and mix and match our data from the different aggregations to learn more than they should. What's maybe striking about this functionality is that there are no keys, only ciphertexts. That means any functionality evaluation will have an empty list for a list of keys. We denote that empty list by epsilon. Even in traditional single input functional encryption, there's a key epsilon that serves to capture the default leakage from ciphertexts. But in a single input setting, that's usually something limited, like the length of the plain text. Here, in a multi-user setting, we can have more complex data leakage depending on the set of ciphertexts that are matched together. So for this sum, if the participants agree on the set of participants and the label, the sum will be revealed. So how can we build a DDFE scheme for the DSUM functionality? Here's a good starting point. If each party were able to compute a mask, such that the mask taken together cancel out, then we would have it mostly figured out, right? Because we can simply publish our element hidden by the mask, and given all of those ciphertexts, you would just add them up, and you would immediately recover the sum of the plain texts. But can we actually do that? Can all of those participants sample a mask that is not uniformly random, but belonging to the structure distribution without relying on a trusted third party, without coordinating and without communicating? The answer to that is yes, in a computational sense. A solution appears in Chase and Chow 2009 and is attributed to Brent Waters. It consists in having each pair of parties computer shared key through a non-interactive key exchange scheme. Then, from that shared key, they can compute a shared randomness that is specific to a label, simply by evaluating a PRF with that key on that label. And now, they can combine all the randomnesses they computed according to this formula here where only some of them have a negative sign. Now it's easy to see that if my randomness with you has a positive sign, then your randomness with me has a negative sign. When we sum it all up together, all the randomnesses cancel out, as we were hoping for. So is this enough to construct DSUM DDFE? It's almost enough. But there's an issue that will stop you from proving security. Let's have a simple example with Alice wanting to aggregate data with Bob 
and Charlie is the one that will compute the sum. Given only a listed ciphertext, Charlie should learn nothing, because he needs one from Bob to decrypt. Once he gets Bob's ciphertext, Charlie should learn the sum. But now, what happens when Alice generates two ciphertexts for the same label and the same pair of participants? It's not obvious why Alice would do that, but hey, nothing's stopping her from generating those ciphertexts, so here she goes. Now, what should Charlie learn here? In theory, Charlie shouldn't learn anything, because he still doesn't have a ciphertext from Bob to evaluate with. But if we just use the mask we talked about earlier, since that mask is deterministic, Charlie can cancel the mask out and evaluate the difference between the original messages. Now you might argue, hey, Charlie was going to learn that by linear combination the second Bob puts out some ciphertext, so what's the big deal? But maybe Bob was never going to do that. So what we want is to have a clean security model that's easy for everyone to understand without caveats that are added in because the cryptographic structure just doesn't quite get us the most natural thing. To that end, we introduce all or nothing encapsulation. It's a DDFE functionality that will solve our problem. In AONE, the message is some fixed length data and again, a set of users and a label. Much like DSUM, AONE has no keys and decryption requires that all ciphertexts agree on the label and the set of participants. Unlike DSUM, AONE simply reveals all of the plain text messages and their association to a participant. So, if AONE reveals all of the data, what is it good for? Well, it only allows this reveal once all the ciphertexts have been received. That's essentially what we were missing for GSUM, the ability to hide everything until everyone has contributed the message. Now, here's a simple idea for constructing AONE. Everyone generates an identity-based encryption key pair and advertises the public key. When you want to encapsulate data, you encrypt it under as many layers of AONE as there are participants. Each layer is under a different participant's public key and under identity L. Finally, you also include your functional key for identity L. And that's pretty much it. Once everyone has done that, you have all the keys for identity L so you can remove all the layers of IBE and get back all the plain texts. Now, the problem with the solution we just described is that each individual ciphertext has size linear in the number of participants. The great news is that if you carefully instantiate our above construction with Bonnie and Franklin's original IBE from 2001, that problem goes away, you can get sucks in ciphertexts. If you're curious, please refer to the paper for details. We can finally move on to our most interesting functionality in our product. It's the most complicated one, so we will simplify things a bit so we can focus on the important ideas. The messages contain a scalar and, as we're used to by now, a set of users and a label. The keys are a vector on a set of participants, so it is a set tying each participant to a scalar. And the functionality is that if all messages agree on the set of participants and the label, and all keys agree on the unique vector y over that same set of participants, we should be able to compute the inner product, which is the sum of the message scalars weighted by the key scalars. As a starting point, let's look at the construction for inner product multi-client functional encryption we introduced at AsiaCrypt 2018. Here, we're reusing DDFE notations for those of you who might not be familiar with MCFE. But basically, in MCFE, there is a central authority which will sample keys for people and hand out the functional decryption keys by relying on its global knowledge of everyone's keys. In GDFE, we have to compute those keys in a decentralized way, which is much harder. So this is an MCFE that has been rewritten to try to achieve a DDFE, but the biggest challenges remain ahead of us. The basic idea here is that encryption is somewhat LGML-like, but the message is placed in the exponent because you want to achieve inner product, which is essentially an additive functionality. And instead of sampling a random exponent, we use a random oracle to compute a random element that is shared between all participants for a given label. 
because you don't know the discrete algorithm of that random Oracle output, you can only encrypt if you know the secret key. But that's fine, because IPDDFE is not a public key functionality. For the functional key, if you're trying to give a key that will enable the user to evaluate inner products with a vector y, well, recall that we essentially have a vector s of secret keys. So we simply give out the inner product between y and s. And then there's a way to combine a bunch of ciphertexts with the functional key. It uses the structure of the group, and you can do the math. It works out, and you get back this inner product. As is common with group-based inner product functional encryption schemes, that result is in the exponent of the group generator. So you have to make sure the result of your computation isn't too big so that you can compute the discrete algorithm. It's a bit unfortunate, but it's usually manageable in practice. So how can we distribute the key generation in this scheme so that it gets closer to being a proper DFE? Well, we said the key is the inner product between the vector y from the functional key and the vector s of the secret key. Another totally equivalent way of looking at it is that it's the sum of the y's multiplied by the appropriate s's. If you see it as a sum, you realize that for key generation, you really want a decentralized, non-interactive way to evaluate this sum. But that's what we were talking about just a few minutes ago. That's this sum, which does indeed let us decentralize key generation. Another issue you run into is that of repeated queries, as we did earlier with this sum. Because encryption is again deterministic, so you can use the group structure to figure out the difference between two plain texts from two ciphertexts for the same set of participants and the same label. Thankfully, it turns out that AONE, which we had used for DSUM, also helps here. Finally, we simplified things a bit here by having simple scalars as messages, but we can actually have vectors as messages. That actually complicates things a bit as far as repeated queries are concerned. This can be addressed by combining a layer of single input inner product functional encryption with another layer of AONE on the functional keys. Again, I'll refer you to the paper for details. Allow me to conclude by recapitulating our main contributions. First, we defined dynamic decentralized functional encryption, which is a framework for describing a variety of crypto systems that enable a server to perform controlled computations on data from a variety of clients. Next, we define three interesting DDFE functionalities, for which we also provide constructions. All or nothing encapsulation is an extremely helpful building block for achieving a natural notion of security in our other functionalities. And we give a generic construction thereof from identity-based encryption with a succinct variant from bilinear maps. We then define decentralized sum, for which our construction makes generic use of AONE and of non-interactive key exchange. Finally, we use both of those functionalities, in addition to prime order groups, to construct a decentralized scheme for the functional evaluation of inner products over sensitive data. That's it for today's presentation. I'd like to thank you again for your interest, and I look forward to interacting with you and answering your questions during the conference.